more markets rallying right now. Futures across the board pointing to strong gains at the start of trading one hour from right now. Investors are watching uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, of course. Take a look at interest rates where they are right now, hovering at 3.1 percent on the 10-year, up four basis points. Joining me right now is BlackRock's global chief investment officer of fundamental fixed income, Rick Reeder, with nearly $2 trillion in assets under management. It's great to see you this morning. Good to see you. Thanks Thank you so much for being here, Rick. And I was really looking forward to speaking with you because you've got such an enormous portfolio mm -hmm. and you have this um, great insight into bonds. So let's start with what's going on with this week's moves. Are we seeing a shift in allocation away from stocks into bonds? So I wouldn't say I think the volatility this week created a flight to quality. I mean, so rates have been backing up, backing up, backing up, and then a flight to quality that caused people to say, gosh, I'm going to get in to put some more treasuries into my portfolio. There's been a big allocation shift in fixed income that people are moving into the front end of the yield curve, buying two-year notes, three-year notes. We talked about it in your show uh, at the beginning of the year. The yes, two-year note is pretty incredible. It now gets you almost 3%. And so and people are thinking about, my God, why do I need to take the risk? I'll just sit in the three year, uh, the two year note at 3%. And so that has been a significant shift. I still think, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how the next, how today plays out, the next couple of days. The volatility in the markets the last couple of days has been pretty amazing. That's going to cause some people some concern. But I think equities, I think you see equities bounce back here on the, over the next few days. So you got, you got a strong backdrop. We've we're, we're got an earnings season that we're expecting to be up 21% on profits and 8% on revenue. But you make the exact point that everybody's debating right now. Why am I going to take on the risk of stocks if I could just sit comfortably in, an, in a security that's giving me 3%? <clears throat> so, Maria, if I, if I were building a portfolio today, the thing I would think about is you can build a barbell. Do you think about where we've been the last few years? I got to get yield in my portfolio. I got to get yield because if I was keeping rates at zero, <clears throat> I need to buy high yield. I need to buy other assets. Today, you can buy the front of the yield curve and clip 3%. And then, you know what? I'll buy some equities that have some risk to it. So you run what is a portfolio that has some upside to it and you carry extremely well. That's, that's the difference in terms of running money today. Now, you've got an enormous bond fund. You've got an enormous mm -hmm. portfolio, $1.9 trillion. Yeah. Did you shift? Did you shift your allocation? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've, so one of the things, I, mean, I would say the best trade in the, in the last, uh, there was something weird that was happening going back two, three weeks ago, where we do a lot in the volatility markets. I don't know if you remember, if you go back two weeks ago, volatility, the VIX index was unbelievably low. Rate volatility was low. It's been flat for two years. It's crazy. It is crazy. And by the way, the liquidity in the markets has come off quite a bit. So we bought a lot of volatility into our funds in both rates, equities, to create some of, some of that. We're, you know, we like the front end of the yield curve. We like carrying really well. We buy a lot of commercial mortgages, residential mortgages, short end, two to three year assets. So we've been doing a ton of that. We've added a little bit of emerging markets recently. We're comfortable. Boy, the repricing of EM has been significant. So we've been doing a bit of that. And, you know, I would say one thing, we buy some upside beta, some convexity buying equities, but we've done it in the volatility market. So then when volatility, <laughs> when the market goes down, all of a sudden you, you de-risk immediately. So where did you find opportunity in equities? So, I mean, I, I, think, I think the place that, you know, look at where we are today, I mean, I, I mean, I think the volatility market, we just like to buy the index to get convexity, but I think some of the places today, I mean, you're talking about banks, it's pretty incredible how some of these markets have really come under pressure. Banks have come under pressure. I would argue technology, which is one of the areas that is, uh, you know, I think commerce is changing faster than people think. We talk about inflation that's not going to go as high as people think. Technology is changing the world. I think some of the repricing the tech market is going to create some really interesting opportunities. Yeah, but today. you have to ask yourself, okay, so the, the Amazon's taking over the world, but am I willing to pay a trillion dollars for it? So, you know, I think when people look at free cash flow generation, there's a whole different world today about, you know, the traditional way, in particular the way lenders thought about it. You think about your hard assets, your collateral. Today, it's all about how much cash flow you can generate today and how much you can generate going forward. And you look at some of those companies, that one in particular, <clears throat> and you look at not only the cash flow they're creating today, but the potential growth of that cash flow that, I, you know, I wonder <clears throat> when people look at, if you look at 12-month or two-year forward earnings and cash flow projections, I, <clears throat> I question the valuations are that high. Okay. So, so you're, you're questioning whether or not it's actually outsized because the, the cash flow is there and the business is there, and you're expecting that to continue. So we do, is we do something. We look at the shift of consumption in the world, and we look at different areas. And why do you see prices coming down in things like food and transportation, <clears throat> apparel? 
The world of commerce has shifted radically, and if you actually put those entities into the right category, some of these technology companies where you put, whether it's an Amazon retailer or, uh, or Facebook and communication, think about the nature of their businesses and how, and how commerce is shifting. I think people are underestimating that. You know, the, the inflation yeah. report yesterday, I mean, you look at it, every economic report we see, you see the impact technology is yeah. having on it. I'm really glad you mentioned that because the CPI, I thought yesterday, the Consumer Price Index, did move markets right. when it first hit the tape because inflation right. was non-existent. Yeah. So where do rates go at this point? I mean, the Federal Reserve obviously mm -hmm. ha has said that they're going to raise interest rates four times this year. Do you think that they're going to raise in December? Definitely raise in December. I think the, uh, you know, we've been pretty uh, non-consensus on the view. The Fed doesn't go that, need to go that much more from where they are today. If you take, you know, we think the consensus is they'll go three to four times next year. Most, most big economists think four times. I think they can do one to two times. If you take where the Fed is in terms of neutral rate, and I think we look at these traditional economic metrics, by the way, that inflation is going to burst out of control. Look at the numbers today. Core CPI is running at one eight for the last three months. The October print last year was two and a quarter. Where's the inflation bursting higher? And if, if you take where our, um, you know, if you think about what true financial conditions are, you just talk about housing. There's some interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. The housing market is clearly, clearly suffering. The housing index, the home builder index, down 25% this year. Wow. I mean, what are autos doing? Does it get worse, sensitive? the home building? So I think what will happen is I think the Fed's going to slow down. I think they're going to pause. I think they should pause. You know, do you go in December and then see where things are, maybe go one more time and pause? <clears throat> so can rates move a little bit higher? I think so, but I don't think they're going much higher from yeah, here. I, you know, I, I tend to agree with you, actually. Mm -hmm. I've been watching this market for a long time, and I feel like why would you continue for this year and then another three next year without stopping and assessing? Yeah, maybe right. the president's <laughs> right. Maybe they are loco. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, the only thing <laughs> I would, joking. The only thing I would, I would say is, is why not pause? I mean, you just put rates were at zero for years. You're just, you're just ratcheting rates higher. If you look at the interest rate sensitivity, by the way, look at small business lending. That's going to start to slow. You look at some of the banks in terms of the numbers. Homes are, homes are interest rate sensitive. Autos are interest rate sensitive. It is breaking somewhat. So, you know, why not take a step back? And the, and the, the, the non-interest sensitive parts of the economy are doing great. Yeah. You don't need to just keep raising rates. It sounds to me like you're painting a picture of, yeah, we're seeing some changes and some shifting as rates move a little higher than rock bottom, but this is not the beginning of no way. a huge sell-off. By, by the way, I think we're near the end of where rates are going to go. I think the neutral rate today, in many instances, the neutral rate is already restrictive. So I don't think, I mean, if you take where we were and think about, you know, we called, I think on your show, we said 10 years going to go to three and a quarter. Let's say inflation is running two and a quarter on general. It's probably, it's less than that, but let's say it's two and a quarter. You put a 1% real rate on top of it, that's your three and a quarter, 10 year. Can we go a little higher? Maybe. But I think we're near in the, uh, you, know, you know, next year we go to three and a half, I think potentially. But I think we've seen the big rate move. So the, so the right allocation would be still stocks as well as fixed income? Yeah, I think fixed income, particularly if you're in the right part of fixed income, you can still make money in fixed income. You know, front-end assets that carry extremely well. I'll just give you one stat that, that blows people away. If you buy the two-year note now, if the Fed raises rates 10 or 11 times next year, in the next year, 10 or 11 Seven times. 11, yeah. 10 or 11 times. You still make money because you carry so well and because you're not taking credit risk. Wow. Making money is more important. People talk about the flattening of the curve. The long end of the yield curve is down 7% this year. I just want to make money. <laughs> the front end is carrying well. I don't need to take the credit risk or interest rate risk. And I think big, big, big deal in terms of how you asset allocate today. Really great insights, Rick. Great Thanks to have you.